I remember when I, was, uh, when I was back in seventh grade, we had a science fair that I participated in, and uh, they told us ahead of time how they were going to judge us for the projects that we did, which was nice because then we could make sure that we ended up focusing our attention in on those areas. Um, and those that, that uh, paid attention to those instructions um, obviously did the best. They were judged most positively because they did pay attention to those instructions. In Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, it says that we're saved by grace through faith. Saved by grace through faith. And this is true. <clears throat> Today, Jesus is going to expose for us what faith means, which is important. Because if our definition of faith is different from God's definition of faith, that's a big problem. Big problem. So, he basically is helping us to see what our part of the equation is. A um, little background, uh, getting us back to par. We're coming back into the sermon series of Matthew. We've taken a break from that during the holiday season, the Easter holiday. Um, so... It's been a little while since we talked, but we are at the end of the Sermon on the, on the Mount. Um, we've been quite a few weeks in the Sermon on the Mount, and what, a, what an incredible sermon that that is, um, that Jesus, really, it starts Jesus' ministry um, after his childhood and, and him, his teaching and so forth. And it's called the Mount, on the Mount, not so much because he was on a mountain, but it's supposed to parallel Moses being on Mount Sinai, that Moses went up on the mountain on Mount Sinai to get the revelation of God, his law, so that Moses could give that to God's people. And it's not Moses, though, that's giving it to his, God's people again. Now it's God himself that is revealing the, the true meaning of the law, what it was always intended to be from the very beginning. That's what, why it's called the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, Right before the Sermon on the Mount, it says that Jesus sat down on the mountain and his disciples came to him and Jesus taught his followers about the true inter interpretation of the law. Now, our section here is the end of the Sermon on the Mount and there are four, it's very fascinating to me how he ends it. There are four warnings of contrast, so meaning one versus two, basically. These are the options here. Um, which apply to entering the kingdom of God. So we're going to look at the first two warnings will be the first section. Second two warnings will be the second section. And then the last one will be the statement that concludes the Sermon on the Mount. And it will reveal to us again how we are to enter heaven. So the first and the second warnings, they expose our lives, expose our faith, so it says, this is the two ways, or the two gates. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate which is wide and the way that is easy leads to destruction. Those who enter it by it are many. For the gate that is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. There are two paths throughout all of, of Scripture, throughout all of Old Testament. There's the way of righteousness. There's the way of wickedness. There's the way, the righteousness is the way of God. The way of wickedness is the way of the world, is the way of Satan also. Um, it's not that hard to really understand. I mean, basically, if you have a road that takes you to L.A., and you have a different road that takes you to New York from here, right? Two totally different directions, totally different roads. So therefore, the road that we're on also shows us the destination that we are heading towards as well. If we're on a certain road, we know we're headed in a certain direction as well. So it illuminates for us our destination. And we go on that road because it know, we know it'll take us there. Right? In the Exodus, God made a way in the wilderness. A way. Now that's an interesting thing because... He took his people out of Egypt, out of slavery. Egypt was the place of comfort, of technology back then, of power and comfort, everything, all of these things. He pulled them out of that and brought them out into the desert, a place with no water, no food, 
No, nothing but heat and sand and rocks. And he provided for them. He made a way for them in the desert. He provided for them and he revealed himself to them in the wilderness, in the desert. Same idea, same thing. Interesting that John the Baptist, when he starts, and the, and the, the Gospels, all of them, for the most part, start with John the Baptist somewhat. Um, but he prepares the way for the Lord, right? Before he comes. And it's a new way. Remember where he is? He's in the wilderness. He's in the desert preaching to them. And the way that he is preaching to them is to repent, to turn to him, to turn from the ways of the world, turn from Egypt and come out to me in the desert and I will prepare a way for you. Those of the way is what Christians were called before they were called Christians. That's what they were called. Those people of the way. The way of God is what they were called. John 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 9, he says, I am the door, I am the gate. Same word. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is the narrow gate. It's hard because those that are Jesus's are not at home now. We're in enemy territory. As witnesses to the living God, who is Jesus. But this path, this way of life, this living, this walking is what leads to life. Following Christ is life giving, but this each path, the path of righteousness, the path of wickedness, each of them are deceptive. Each of them looks one way, but in reality, it's very different than what it seems. The word hard, the narrow gate, the narrow path, Hard, the word means oppression. There will be suffering in this world and it will be because we identify ourselves with Christ. He is not of the world, no more as we are of the world. It is different. Doesn't like those that are of Christ because he has chosen them out of the world. In the Beatitudes, I find it also fascinating because that's the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, right? Chapter five, we started off the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus starts off by saying, blessed are those who are this. Blessed are those who are this. And it goes through a number of different things. The first one says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. That's not the best way to sell something, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit, are those who are devastated, who souls hunger and thirst for something that they have not reached. And then it says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first one and the last one, both of them end with theirs are, is the kingdom of heaven. The first one is the blessed are those who are poor in spirit. And the last one says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Righteousness sake is later defined in that text as Jesus' account on Jesus' account. Their reward is great in heaven. They are like the prophets of old that were loyal to God, that they spoke what he told them in truth. They were true prophets. See, faith exposed, exposes what we follow. Christ, is Christ more worth following than the world? That's a, an answer or question that we all have to answer. Is Christ more worth following than the world? What we say isn't as important as what we do. Do we follow? Do we follow? Wide gate is easy because it magnetically pulls us. We have a natural pull towards that of the world. And all who live in it, it seems great. That seems like the path to go on. It makes sense. That's the one where riches are. That's the one where it seems like these are the people that have it all together, right? We get sucked into it, but those that bow down to the ways of the world as opposed to God are re rewarded by it only in the things that the world can give. 
money, popularity, comforts, toys, whatever. But it can't give true life. And even if it seems like it's giving true life, where you're like, this is great, it doesn't last. Eventually, it shows that it was deceptive. We find out that no amount of money can really truly give you the happiness that we all really crave. Eventually. And what hurts so much is because once we've walked it, and a lot of times that's what we have to do, is we have to walk that path first and realize it after a while where you're surrounded by a whole bunch of things and you say, I would trade all of this stuff just for some peace. I would trade all of this just for a little bit of happiness because my life is a mess. The way that leads to death is the way of the world because we're still under the wrath of God. Condemned by the curse of sin, which we came under in Genesis 3. Once we rebelled against God's word, then the curse came upon us. It's the way of destruction. These are the ones that are enslaved to Satan. All who follow Satan are going where he's going. To the lake of fire. When we walk the narrow path, we are enslaved to Christ, though. And the most horrifying thing in this statement is it says that few find it. Few will find it. This is a call to walk with God, to follow him. Surrender to him as his servants. He is master, us as slaves. If we do, Jesus becomes our identity. And when we stand before him in the end, he recognizes us because he sees himself in us. And the gate opens for us. The second account is that of the trees. It says, beware of false, of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not all prophets or pastors are good. But Jesus tells us how to identify them as true or false. Their fruit will reveal who they belong to. These are habitual practices. It's not a mistake. Oh, they made a mistake in this area, so therefore they must belong to Satan. No, these are habitual things. They're life that produces a certain type of fruit. Galatians 5, 19 through 23, it tells us examples of good fruit and bad fruit. It says good fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Bad fruit is sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and all the like. Everything that's like this. What it's saying here, to even summarize it even more, is that God and his fruit is that of unity, of love, of life. That of Satan is death, division, fighting. Also, the Old Testament reveals how certain prophets could only proclaim, uh, or that they would only proclaim what was comforting and not offending. These were the false prophets. They were self-preserving. They wouldn't say anything to anybody that would offend anybody because that means that they might not get paid for what they do people might not like them. They wouldn't be able to be a prophet in the king's quarters because the things that they said might condemn the king. Heck, they might even be killed for what was happening. Those were false prophets. The good ones were the ones that no matter what, they preached what God said, and sometimes it was unpopular. See, by 
ignoring God, they were ignoring the sins that the people were doing. And hence, they, des- they destined every one of God's people to destruction. In fact, at one point, God says in his word, he said, if you would just tell the people what their sins are and call them into pre- repentance, and if they did that, I would turn from them and I would give them life. But because you won't even tell them what it is that they're doing wrong, they all are going to die. And you are fired from being my prophet as well. The good shepherds will even put themselves on the line if necessary for the life of the sheep. It's not what's happening now. It's the eternal that is most important. Those who know God know that he is to be feared. He is cosmic judge and that he prefers also love more and wants to show mercy. He's both. The true prophets will always be most concerned with serving God by guiding people into his love and know that they will be held accountable one day for the way that they cared for his flock. We have this today. I mean, in the New Testament, you see the Sadducees and the Pharisees, same idea, both extremes, too far to the love, the other one, the Pharisees, too far to the the judgment, right? We got that today also. I'm telling you right now, be careful, beware of the prosperity preachers that are out there. They make a lot of money and they got huge ministries and they are all over the television and they tell you that God wants you to be happy. He wants your business to be prosperous. He wants you to buy nice clothes. He wants you to have nice cars and stuff. He wants you to be happy. God wants us to come into our purpose. That's what he wants. Our purpose is not to be happy. Think about that. How self-centered is that is for us to say, God just wants me to be happy, so he just wants me to do whatever I want to do. No, he doesn't. If he did that, then why would he send his son to go on the cross? Obviously, he doesn't think that. He wants us to come back into our purpose. Our purpose has always been, from the very beginning of the Bible, it says to glorify him, to glorify him, to praise him. Sometimes that means at our own expense. But if we are living in our purpose, we will be more happy there than anywhere else. So does he want us to be happy? Yeah. But he knows that the only way that we can get there is by operating in our purpose. So we need to have faith. And sometimes it doesn't look like that's true. Where you're like, that path looks like a lot of pain. That one looks like a lot of fun. I want to go that one. That's the one to death, that's the one to life. I've had my own experiences that I was like, God, I I really don't want to go down that path, but I know that's the one that you've opened for me. Couldn't you have made it a little better? (laughs) And as I walked down it, you know, sometimes kind of kicking the stones a little bit as I'm going, He actually starts to show me that I see the life that he's doing in it. And he meets me there. And the more I walk with him, the more that I see that he's with me. And the more that he, the the true deception, truth comes into it. And I see that life is truly on that path. And I'm so glad that I walked it. On the other side, the other, the, the other pastors and preachers of the gloom and doom and you're all going to die, you're all sinners and stuff. Yeah, we are all sinners and we are all condemned to death, but that's not the end of the story. God prefers to give us life. He says, repent and I will forgive you. In fact, so badly I want that to happen that I sent my son to die for you so that you don't have to die. You can live. He gives us a way out. So both are there. He is cosmic judge, and he is to be feared. He should be terrified of him. But he also is a God of love, and he wants to love us. So he says, don't make me be a God that is of, of wrath to you. Live in my love. 
If you just listen to my word, you don't have to live in my wrath. You can live in my love. Please, he even says, live in my mercy, my love, my grace. What path are we on? Who are our teachers? Does the path that we walk and the teachers we learn from illuminate that we are following Jesus or the world? If the focus is on me, then it's of the world. If it's on Jesus and God, it is of God. We must die to self before victory in Christ is possible. Most Christians are not willing to die to self, and that's why it's so hard for them to be a Christian. It's impossible. They say it's so hard to be a Christian. It's, it's challenging, but it's not impossible at all if we die to ourself. In fact, it's fairly simple once we die to ourself. The hardest thing is to die to ourself first. Once we do that, it actually gets a lot easier. All right, the second one. Third and fourth warnings. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? And do mighty works in your name, miracles in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. The second warning that we just passed was about false prophets, false teachers. This one deals with false followers. They absolutely could be false followers because of the false teachers. Could be. But when a person says, Lord, Lord, what that's basically saying is someone earnestly calling out to Jesus, you are my Lord. With all of outside, it looks like it is with their heart. They believe they're true followers of Christ, but they're missing an important element here. They look and sound like followers of Jesus, but Jesus isn't buying it. Just because we call ourselves Christians, or call Jesus our Lord and Savior does not mean that we're going to heaven. Just because we came to church even occasionally does not mean that we're going to heaven. Many will say to me who call themselves Christians and do the work, the ministry of Christ, dedicate their life to him, are not his. That's scary. They might speak on God's behalf. They might say, I'm a prophet. The Lord, O oh God, the mighty one of God has told me this. Hear the word of the Lord. They might cast out demons in Christ's name, which is important to highlight here. That's also something, it's a whole other subject matter. But that is something that's part of the work of the church, to cast out demons as well. That's not something that has stopped. Now, where in the Bible do you hear it say, stop casting out demons? That's not necessary anymore. In fact, it actually says that things like that will get worse. But regardless, they might do miracles in Jesus' name, but they don't know God intimately. They don't surrender to him. They don't submit to him. All they do, it doesn't follow him. They're not being transformed by the Spirit of God. They don't do or know the will of the Father. Just because we say in Christ's name at the end of a prayer, now I say it a lot, but it doesn't mean that that's in, that's, that's in the likeness of Jesus or that the work is even really honoring him. In fact, that phrase, really what it means, it's supposed to mean in his likeness. When it says that in his name, it's basically saying that in the likeness of Christ, in his image, in his likeness, just because we say it doesn't mean that it is. Jesus says, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. He's basically ultimately saying, he's going back even, they're not bearing good fruit at all. Just because they do his work, they think, it looks like to the world that they're doing good. They're not his. Jesus commands intimacy 
moment by moment, surrender, submission, walking with, living with, reading his word, prayer. We will know, he will know us intimately when we walk in his way and bear his fruit. We must know God's word before we can know his will. His word shows us what his will is. The third, I'm sorry, the fourth, the two builders. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. The rock is from the Old Testament that is the Lord who provided for them in the desert water and manna, food. And everyone who hears these words of mine does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Both houses look great in good weather, right? But when the storm comes, and it is coming for all of us, that's what will test how it was built. The rain fell, the word used for that fell means comes, came down, descended. The word for fell when it's used with the house means destroyed. It's a different word. Destroyed, collapsed, perished. The storm overcame the dwelling place. Our place of living, our life, was devastated. God calls us to listen and to obey. That's what following Christ means. This establishes a firm foundation of our dwelling place, not to be destroyed, but to endure, to live on. The storms are coming in our life. Are we ready for them? Sometimes in the storm is where we realize that our house has been built on the sand. Why wait till then, though? Why wait till then? Better to prepare and be ready. The Word of God tells us the way of God. It tells us, Jesus tells us, how to walk in the way of God, how to get through the gate, how to bear good fruit, how to know and do the will of God, how to build our home on the rock. Are we listening? Are we following? I called myself a Christian a number of years, basically up through 33 years old, about 33 to 35. And I would have said, Lord, Lord, to Jesus on Judgment Day. But I didn't know him. And it was only when I, the storm hit me and devastated everything I had that I realized that I was on the road not to life, but to destruction. My foundation had been built not on the rock, but on the sand. And now I sat in darkness and ruin. On the edge of death itself, devastation overwhelmed me. And I prayed earnestly for God to give me a second chance. And thankfully, he gave it to me. Our Bible study is called Not a Fan. It challenges us to truly explore if we're just fans of Jesus, we just cheer for him, or if we are followers. Followers go wherever Jesus leads them. They allow Jesus into every area of their life. They're committed to him wholeheartedly and they have died to themselves. A follower knows God's word. They pray constantly. They walk with him and they are willing to sacrifice everything for him because he is their rock, their foundation, their hope, not the world. Are we fans or followers? It is a journey. So if we are fans merely, my question is are we willing to become followers? Do we want to be a follower? Only followers know Jesus intimately and they will receive the power of true life eternally. 
last section. It's the two teachers. Even though this is not a warning, it's interesting that he gives four warnings of A and B, one and two, and then it ends not with the warning, but still, it's a, com it's a comparison of two still. <clears throat> and when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not like their scribes. One had authority, Jesus. And one didn't. All their teachers. They're scribes, they're scholars that taught them before. Authority means the power to enforce law, to require obedience, to command, to determine, or judge. The scribes looked like it. They had all the garments and the following and the temple and everything. And I'm sure Jesus looked pretty rough. I'm sure he looked pretty rough. But when they heard him talk, they knew who had authority. Jesus is the word of God in the flesh. God himself is teaching his law to his people here. If he's eternal judge, then we should be taking very careful consideration into what he's saying here to us. He's telling us ahead of time, like the science fair, this is how I'm going to judge you. Pay attention to this. This is important. This is important. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the way of God. I'm the truth and the life. No one, who comes, no one comes to the Father except through me. I'm the gate. I'm the narrow path. And anyone who comes to Jesus will not perish, will live. Doesn't our government post the law of our society out for us? To give us fair warning and to understand, to follow the laws? When we ignore those in authority who enforce the laws like the government, what happens? We have to pay a penalty, right? Punished. Are we willing to pay an eternal price with Jesus? Have we submitted to him as our authority in our lives? Faith is illuminated here as how we live in relation to Jesus. That's important. And that might not be the, the, the message that we want to hear. But let me say this, that Every one of us that are here today, you were brought here by God today. It's not a coincidence. It didn't just happen. There's nobody in this room that can say at that time, God, I didn't know. I never knew. What he'll say is, you remember back in uh, April, Pastor Derek gave a message. Do you remember? And some of us might be like, oh yeah, I didn't like that at all. <laughs> that was a horrible message. Then my prayer for you is this. I didn't write this. God wrote this. All I'm doing is sharing it with you. If you've got a problem with it, then you've got a problem with God, not me. But I'm not going to hold it back just because so we can be friends. I would much rather share eternity with you and love you as opposed to be your friend now and know that you never made it in because I didn't have the courage to say what needed to be said. If we ignore his word, then we just cheer for him and not follow. We have no faith and we're actually judged as rebels, as enemies of God and of his kingdom. But if Jesus is the authority in our lives, we have faith in him. Then we know his word, his will, his spirit, and we will walk in his way as his servants. We will bear fruit in his likeness. He will know us, and he will know, we will know him very intimately. And we'll be able to endure any storm 
Because we know for certain that God is with us. We have his presence. And when we come to judgment day, he will welcome us into heaven. The door will be opened. If anyone in here is thinking, well, I don't have all those things that you're talking about, and I thought that, that, that we're saved by grace alone, by faith, through faith. We are. Nothing gets us into heaven that we did. Jesus, what he did at the cross, gets us into heaven. It opens the door for us. But he's still standing at the gate. Our part is the faith part. He made a way back that was never there before. Our faith part, if that's what it is, then we need to know what faith means. And what this is telling us is that faith is a face that follows. When Jesus calls out to all of his disciples, follow me, that's what he's saying. It gives us an example. Every day, following him, living with him, listening to him. What he's saying here, those that listen and do what I'm telling them to do will have their house built on the rock. No matter what storm comes against you, you have nothing to fear. If you say, well, I'm not there yet. What God asks for us, faith is this, is that I want to follow you. Peter, when he first started, was a mess when he started following Jesus. Amen? As he goes through him, he gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Moses was the same way. He was a coward at one point and becomes a mighty, awesome believer in God and leader, it's a process, but we have to give our heart to God and say, I want to follow you. I'm willing to follow you. Wherever you lead me, I will go. I haven't known your word in the past, but I want to. I want to learn it. Open doors for me and show me people that'll help me with it. That's good enough. That's what he wants. He doesn't demand perfection, but he wants your heart. He wants you, all of you. Not just a piece, the whole thing. So, the proposition here is we must know Jesus intimately by following him in order to enter heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.